I was selling you know, up to five or 10 kilos of coke a week. On a couple of occasions, people had tried to kill me. I ended up spending nine years in prison in Ecuador. I've had a few nicknames throughout my time trafficking. One of them is Posh Pete. My name is Peter Tritton and I'm an ex-international cocaine trafficker. The first international import I ever did was from Holland. Uh, of 2,000 pills, brought them in just before Christmas and made everyone's Christmas really good <laughs> and New Year's Eve. And it was actually quite a few years after I did that that I ever got into the cocaine trafficking because I ended up in prison. So that kind of stalled things. <laughs> I'd just been around to visit a friend uh, to drop off some coke. And I had a briefcase in the front of the van in which there were, I think, maybe a, a, a thousand pills, you know, a couple of ounces of coke, scales, and also a sawn off shotgun in the back of the van. And a marked police car came up behind me and, and pulled me over, basically. Very quickly, it became obvious that it wasn't a routine traffic stop. They immediately went into the front of the van and pulled out a briefcase. I'm like, oh, look what we found. The whole world just stops, freeze frame. You know, you're going one place and that's behind the walls and bars of a prison. During my time in prison, uh, towards the end, I decided that, you know, should I decide to get back into trafficking drugs, that it would be cocaine because it was low volume and high value. Having been released, didn't do anything for several months, uh, then got tempted, made a phone call, and said, look, can you try and find me a source who would be able to give us the hookup uh, out in South America for the cocaine. So sat around in this kitchen in London talking to the Colombian. And he says to me, you know, we're bringing the cocaine in and we're, we're bringing in impregnated in rubber. And then they were putting it into the ground sheets of tents as if it was part of the ground sheet. So it was absolutely perfect. And I was like, wow, that is really cool. I like the sound of this. So the first one, collected it from Quito, got it back to England, we extracted it, sold it, uh, made about, I don't know, 100, 120,000 each. Um, yeah, it was good, really good feeling to get that back. So was the end when I was living in a manor house and driving Mercedes and just being too flash, basically. On a couple of occasions, people had tried to kill me. Um, I had a gun pulled on me once in London, uh, a Derringer two-shot pistol in Chiswick because obviously by that point I was selling you know, up to five or ten kilos of coke a week. Volumes of money involved by that point were, you know, well worth someone's while and killing me, basically. The level of paranoia was insane. You have constantly, certainly at that sort of level, you know, when you're running around with kilos of cocaine and tons of hash and, you know, stuff, big amounts that you know you're going to prison for maybe ten years plus at least. I ended up spending nine years in prison in Ecuador. Having been arrested in Quito, in Ecuador, I tried to escape, so they transferred me to the fourth most dangerous prison in the whole of South America, which at that time held 8,000 people, was split between two rival gangs, completely gang controlled. Uh, the two gangs were at war with each other, handguns, explosives, machine guns in the prison, four or five murders a week. Just absolutely insane. It became my sort of pastime coming up with ways of escaping. I employed some people to dig a tunnel out of the prison. <laughs> Unfortunately, it got discovered. I was also planning with members of the FARC that we get an RPG rocket propelled grenade and blow the, blow the wall of the prison and get some machine gun covering fire on the watchtowers. Uh, and then make our escape like that as well. Or a helicopter lift, but that was too expensive. <laughs> By this point, actually, in Quito, I'd more or less ended up in charge of the wing that I was living on, uh, because I have a knack of organising people and, and sorting things out. And I'd realised that no one was really bringing any coke, good cocaine into the prison. 
obviously there's a big opportunity and there's you know it's a wing full of foreigners they're the ones that take the most drugs they've got the money so i think well, you know, i might as well start running it wing was normally quite busy in the evening you know people running about cooking getting their drugs doing drugs I had taken a plate of food to a friend of mine. No one's doors are open, it's very quiet, it's, you know, you can feel something's not quite right. And there's just been this, this explosion right next to my head. Here. And uh, one of this other gang had come up behind me with a handgun, shot over my shoulder, and right in front of me has, has shot the guy in the face, blowing the back of his head out. Um, so he's dead. Dived in my room, slammed the door shut. Two hour long gunfight ensued. A couple of the other gang, gang members came out of their cells, so did this lot. So there was about 10 on one side shooting and about two or three on the other. Using one had an Uzi, Uzi submachine gun, uh, a nine mil like several nine millimeters, uh, 38s, uh, Colt 45. I mean, a lot of gunfire, a lot. We were transferred en masse uh, from the old prison in Guayaquil, the really dangerous one, into this new prison with all high security, you know, cameras everywhere. We went from having basically freedom to do whatever you wanted, you know, your own cell, TVs, to suddenly nothing. There was a light that came on at 6 p.m. and went off at 10 p.m. Held completely incommunicado for too much to disappear. So at that point I went, <laughs> get me out of <laughs> here. So the embassy restarted the process to get me back to Britain. I remember getting back to Wandsworth and being put in a cell and I was just like, wow, this feels like a hotel room to me. And all these people are coming into the prison, you know, just from London, and they're crying and moaning and going, so bad, it's terrible, the food's really bad if we only get visits three times a week. And I was just like, are you mad? This is fantastic. Uh, they probably thought I was insane. <laughs> I've now been out of prison for about two years. Coming out, I just felt, you know, that everybody knew I was an ex-con and I'd just come out of prison. And I honestly felt like I had convict tattooed across my forehead. I was diagnosed as having a post-traumatic stress disorder. It being in that sort of environment, is it almost like a war zone that you can't get out of. It's just horrendous. I'm just still readjusting, really, to be honest. <laughs> It is a dangerous business to be in. Most of my friends that were involved, I'd say probably 60, 70% are dead. There's very few people that, that go through life as a cocaine trafficker or any, sort of, or any sort of drug trafficker that haven't been to prison or that are alive. Every day I wake up and I'm just happy to be alive, just to be able to breathe fresh air and open my eyes and know I'm safe. I'm very lucky to be alive. I mean, there are still people out there that still want to kill me now. But that's life.